Hi and welcome. Today we're going to dive into histamine intolerance, how to diagnose, understand, and treat its root causes through a functional medicine approach. Hi, my name is Dr. Ariane Missimer. I'm a functional medicine practitioner, doctor of physical therapy, registered dietitian, and I am super inspired by this topic because I've been seeing so many of my patients come in and presenting with histamine intolerance. And through this process, I've realized that we have to have a systematic approach to understanding it and addressing their particular root causes. So what is histamine? Essentially, it's a chemical that's involved in our immune system, in our digestive system, and our central nervous system. So essentially, histamine is released by the body by basophils, which are a white blood cell that's composed of granulocytes. These are found within the mast cell. So both the mast cells and the basophils are going to lie near the connective tissue, which is where histamine is ultimately released for a potential foreign invader. So the release of histamine is going to make it easier for white blood cells to pass through the tiniest little capillaries, which then can target and attack foreign invaders as part of our overall immune response. So how does the body break down histamine? When we're referring to a histamine intolerance, it's essentially resulting from an imbalance between the amount of histamine that is being produced and our body's ability to break it down. So in the central nervous system, histamine is mainly broken down by histamine and methyltransferase, which is more genetically influenced. And then in the digestive tract, histamine is mainly broken down by the Dow enzyme, diamine oxidase. So due to a variety of reasons, our bodies might not be able to produce enough of one or the other or both, which can create a histamine intolerance. So histidine is one of our essential amino acids, and that is going to be the precursor for histamine. So that is broken down via L-histidine deep carboxylase, and then histamine will be broken down further via the Dow enzyme or HNMT. So when we have activation of these mast cells and produce a histamine release, this can be related to microorganisms, allergens, drugs, toxins, physical stimuli. And because there are four different receptors in the body that are located throughout the body, as I mentioned earlier, can have this very widespread systemic effect. But you can conversely have one person that's experiencing allergy symptoms, sneezing, wheezing, congestion, and you could have someone else who's suffering from extreme anxiety, which is going to be someone that I'll talk about later in the presentation. So from a brain and central nervous system perspective, you can have things like headaches, anxiety, insomnia. You can have stomach issues because of the release of gastric acid from histamine. So you could have things like acid reflux, one of the most most common symptoms of histamine intolerance is actually bloating, and this is because of the association with SIBO. From a nasal perspective, as I mentioned, you could have all of the allergic type symptoms. You could have skin issues such as itching or flushing or hives. You can have blood vessels that are dilating and swelling. You can have wheezing associated with lungs. You could have hypertension. You could even have things that are related to the uterus. So there is such a, a widespread set of symptoms that could be associated with histamine intolerance, which is why I was so interested in this topic and how it can be affecting people so uniquely and why it's really important to have a systematic approach for each person to be able to really identify what their biggest drivers are of this if they're experiencing some of these symptoms. So as it relates to high histamine foods, this can get quite complex because there are really healthy foods that normally we would want to consume in our diet that unfortunately are high histamine. So if someone is intolerant, these can be very problematic. So there's foods that are going to be high in histamine, such as aged or fermented foods, things like leftovers, packaged processed foods, things have been that have been sitting in the fridge for a few days. Fish is extremely high in histamine, but in addition to that, it also can inhibit the Dow enzyme. Something like sardines or any of our canned fishes, all of these can be extremely high in histamine. Now, Now, there's other foods that are going to inhibit the Dow enzyme, like fish. So this is one of the biggest ones is alcohol. So not only is alcohol high in histamine, but it is also reducing the Dow enzyme. And so essentially they're competing for the same enzyme, which is the aldehyde dehydrogenase. And so ultimately this can cause a 
really, really big response in someone who is histamine intolerant. And then you also have foods that are going to increase the release of histamine. And these things can be citrus fruits, uh, which are also going to decrease that Dow enzyme. So there's lots of variations of foods that could potentially be problematic, where otherwise we know that these are really healthy, even things like spinach or avocado or tomatoes, those are high in histamine. And obviously we know that they are really, really good for us. So a low histamine diet can be quite challenging gene. And I'll talk a little bit more about that when we talk about diagnosis. And the last source of histamines is actually the gut. And the reason for this is because with our diverse microbiome, we can have certain bacteria, especially as it relates to an overgrowth of bacteria in the small intestine, otherwise known as SIBO, or even a dysbiosis in the large bowel, we can have either histamine producing microbes or mast cell activating microbes. And so this could range from histamine producing such as lactobacillus, Klebsiella, Proteus, uh, Pseudonomus, from mast cell activating microbes. We have things like H. pylori infection. We have streptococcus, candida. So all of these can influence a increased amount of histamine. And we will also talk about the inability to break it down with gut issues as well. If you have leaky gut, which is where we have increased intestinal permeability in the lining of the small intestine, what can happen is we can have histamine that goes directly into the bloodstream that's going to increase that immune response, increase the release of lipopolysaccharides, which is our endotoxin, creating the systemic response. So this can also be very problematic. And then last but not least is SIBO. So with SIBO, as I mentioned, we have this overgrowth of bacteria that's affecting the small intestine where we're not supposed to have a lot of bacteria and therefore is going to affect nutrient absorption and it is also going to affect the microvilli specifically on the glycocalyx. So this is that protective glycoprotein layer which is going to be where the Dow enzyme lies and is helping to break down histamines. So when we have SIBO and especially chronic SIBO, this can contribute to a histamine intolerance over time because of the inability to break down via the Dow enzyme. So now now let's get into some of the root causes. So number one is we can have, of course, a genetic SNP. So we can have a Dow enzyme deficiency. And in this case, there has been noted that there is over 85 different SNPs located on this particular gene. So we do have to recognize that this is a possibility. So genetic testing can be valuable if you have undergone all of the proper testing and you still are at a loss for where this person is as it relates to their histamine intolerance. And of course, we want to consider medications because there's medications that can actually increase their histamines and also can affect their ability to break them down. So there are many medications that can influence this from antidepressants to immune modulators to antihistamines and even our antihypertensives. So I have a patient right now that has been completely dysregulated as it relates to blood pressure and has been on all of these different medications which have only made him worse and I believe that that is primarily because it is inducing some of his of an increased histamine issue and again he has an inability to break it down so we also want to factor in all of the things I just mentioned as it relates to gut but just to take that a step further so we want to remember SIBO is definitely a huge root cause so it is something that I'm always looking at first to determine is is SIBO the issue and is that what we need to focus on addressing first so that we can address their histamine intolerance. So putting someone on a low histamine diet for a long period of time is really challenging. You're missing a lot of important nutrients. So if we can address the root cause as quickly as possible, then that can allow them that opportunity to consume histamines and hopefully get on a better path sooner. As I mentioned with leaky gut, we have that increased release of histamine into the bloodstream because of the increased intestinal permeability. And actually in people with celiac disease that are not responding, so non-responders to treatment, in up to 50% of 
of people, it's been shown that there's a histamine intolerance. So, of course, when we're thinking of celiac, the longer you have celiac, it's destroying the microvilli and it's destroying that, it's, a, it's influencing that glycocalyx, which is going to affect the Dow enzyme. So it completely makes sense that there would be a correlation there or could be a correlation there. But we also can see that in non-celiac gluten sensitivity, that there is also often a correlation, even though that's only 8% of the population, there's also a correlation with histamine intolerance. So now that we've laid a little groundwork, now we can talk about evaluating the histamine intolerance. So one of the things that I've found really helpful is doing a histamine intolerance questionnaire. I find this to be really helpful for me as well as the patient because it allows them to organize their symptoms and their potential foods that they're consuming or medications that they're on to be able to get a better sense of if, if there is a correlation. And a lot of times it's very enlightening for them and of course always valuable for me. You can look at the Dow serum values. This is not necessarily the best biomarker, but it could look at a more complete picture. We of course can consider our polymorphisms. So this could be specific genetic testing. This might not be the first thing that you do, but it could be on your list of evaluate evaluation. One of the gold standards of evaluating histamine tolerance is actually doing a two-week elimination diet of histamines. So this can allow you to see, do, does the symptom, patient's symptoms improve over this time period? And if so, then you can begin to evaluate in more depth. Some other things that we want to think about, though, are, of course, ruling in or out allergies. So someone could have allergies in addition to a histamine intolerance as well. And so you just want to make sure that you're looking at all of these different aspects. That, of course, would be as it relates to blood work. And then tryptase can be helpful in the diagnosis of either mast cell activation, which is where tryptase would be elevated in a particular flare, or if tryptase is consistently elevated, then that can be suggestive of mastocytosis where there's, there's this constant activation of the immune system as it relates to histamines. So all of these things are really important. So I will typically prioritize the questionnaire and the diet if I'm pretty sure that that's that's where we're going with this. I'll just explain to my patients that this is a really easy test. Hey, let's just do a couple things to see where we need to go next. And that would be before we move into other things. So I, I refer to these as more of the direct measures of looking at the histamine intolerance or ruling things in and out. And then we could go into more of your indirect where we're looking, beginning to look at root causes. And of course, this could really be expansive. But the things I want to talk about today are one, a comprehensive stool test. So this is going to give us an, a really great idea if there is histamine producing or mast cell activating microbes. If there's something like H. pylori that can drive histamine um, intolerance, we could do SIBO testing. So if we do the stool test and we see the SIBO pattern and it's it's also correlating with their clinical presentation, then we can do the SIBO test to confirm that or again, rule in or rule out. And these are just, again, some measures, but we do want to really understand, you know, what are all the things related to the gut that could be happening? So is there leaky gut? Is there a non-celiac gluten sensitivity? Is there, are there antibodies to gluten that we all can see in the stool test, which is really nice. Now I'd love to share a case study with you that really brought a lot of this to light for me and helped me to really look at histamine intolerance through a different lens. So Ben was a 53-year-old male, husband, dad of three boys, successful entrepreneur, and began experiencing pretty distressive symptoms over the, the course of six months. He had COVID and he was complaining of persistent, the, the key things that he was complaining of were persistent throat clearing, excessive mucus production. He was having uh, heart rate spikes with Standing, fainting episodes, a lot of vasovagal responses. He was hospitalized for three days. He was having facial swelling, lightheadedness, blood pressure dysregulation, flushing, palpitations, nausea. So all of the histamine receptors you can envision were being influenced. These symptoms were obviously significantly affecting his life. So we had, we worked together for quite some time and we had a lot of things to obviously work through. So one of the things, of course, that I did with him 
was a low histamine diet, which did improve his symptoms. We also did a stool test and found that he had quite a few histamine producing microbes as well as mast cell activating microbes, including H. pylori. So this was a really big aspect for him because we wanted to try to address the root cause. But in addition to this, he also, we also did an allergy panel and he was allergic to dog and cat dander and he had a dog. So he was also having allergic symptoms. He was also having post viral symptoms and his tryptase was consistently elevated which in essence is going to confirm the diagnosis of mastocytosis which is that ongoing release of histamines so we had a lot of different things to work through here and uh, what we did was we focused on nervous system regulation because he did have the diagnosis of POTS and he was really experiencing some cardiovascular issues as well as the all of the other issues that I just spoke of. So he, we did vagus nerve exercises and stimulation. We did lymph drainage. So really trying to clear his system, which was really important. We focused on some of his airway and immune system as it relates to his sinuses. So we used an x nasal rinse with xylitol. We did nasal dilators because again, this was a, a huge part for him as it relates to his immune system. We did Dow supplementation. So I encouraged him to take that, of course, if he was having a histamine food. We also were addressing the salt as it relates to the pots. So we did a multi-factor, which was a basically a, a really well-rounded multivitamin, omega, et cetera. We did magnesium. We did ashwagandha to help regulate his nervous system. We did inositol to help with the dysautonomia. And we also did quercetin and stinging nettle. So this is really helpful to inhibit the release of histamine. And this was, I think, a really helpful part of his treatment and then we also moved into different phases of healing his gut so the first phase I like to break them up into phases so the first phase we addressed the biofilms we addressed the H. pylori specifically and we also were supporting his immune system of his gut so he had very low secretory IgA leaky gut so we were really trying to focus on optimizing that and then phase two we were doing some supplementation for hydrochloric acid to help him be able to break down his his protein specifically a little bit better we did candibactin arbr to address some of that small intestine pattern that he was having and then at his three-month follow-up he did do a h pylori test which was negative and we did not have the opportunity to retest all of his his stool test specifically Specifically, but his tryptase began to came down, come down significantly. His symptoms resolved. He was feeling really good. Started working out at the gym, and it was really, really awesome, awesome experience to watch his journey and be able to pull together all of these different aspects. Because I think he was a complicated case, and it was really interesting to see the level of detail that was happening with each and every aspect of his case. So everything that we implemented was very intentional, very purposeful, and we did things systematically. But looking at all of the things that I spoke about today, from leaky gut to SIBO to his medications to all of the things that were either histamine producing or potentially inhibiting the Dow enzyme, and then addressing the gut to improve his absorption. And it was now he's in a much better place. Uh, We have not retested his tryptase since, but his tryptase came down quite a bit. So it was a really great example of a complicated histamine intolerance case that I hope that you can use some of this information to be able to look through a different lens and really try to break each part down. And again, I think the most important part is listening to the person in front of you. I always talk about it's not just a protocol and it's not just tests that you're doing, but it's really treating the human in front of you. So I hope this was helpful and I look forward to seeing you again. If you're a practitioner who orders lab tests, we have the perfect solution for you. RiffaHealth.com offers hundreds of lab tests from over 30 different lab companies like Genova, Mosaic, Dutch, and more. Head on over to RiffaHealth.com to sign up for free today.